Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Father, we, we delight in coming before your presence. We delight in coming before you, Lord. We delight being here this morning. My heart is filled with you, with your presence. My soul thirsts after you. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be abundant in us, upon us, among us, within us. Oh God, your word is living. I just pray, my Father, for the anointing of your Spirit, that I may indeed bring it to life even more, and that you would open all our hearts. Father, that you would open all our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. May I ask you, please, and invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we are this morning in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. 22nd chapter of Matthew. There are Bibles in your pews in front of you. There are also, what I'm going to be speaking about today is also in your insert. It is the Gospel that was read this morning by Deacon Diane. You might also have your Bibles in your phones or iPads or any of those uh, items. And um, I will primarily be preaching, as I always say to you, from the New King James Bible, the New King James. But if you don't have the New King James, I'm very, very sure that Maybe some translation says a word here and there different, but the message is the same. So just open your Bibles, open your hearts, and hear what the Lord may have to say to you and to me uh, this morning. Just uh, a little bit of reminder of what uh, we have been talking about, because this is a, a continuation of where we have been in in Sundays before, but about two Sundays ago, I taught you from the parable of the vineyard, the parable of Jesus uh, about the vineyard. And one of the things I shared with you when I preached on that parable, which I thought was important, was how the ministry of Jesus had changed from when he was in Galilee to where he is now in Judea. If you remember, I had shared with you that while Jesus in, in his first, probably first two years, if not a lot longer that he spent in Galilee, whenever Jesus did a miracle or did a, a great teaching or, or something and people got so excited and they wanted to go tell everybody about it, Jesus would normally say, no, uh, don't, don't announce who I am. Keep it to yourself. You know, let's keep it quiet for now. Um, no, don't. Don't announce it. Uh, at one time, they wanted to take him and make him king, and he pretty much ran away from everybody that wanted to make him king. But what I shared with you uh, on my sermon two weeks ago was that now that Jesus is in Judea, in Jerusalem, everything changes. Jesus no longer wants to keep anything quiet. Okay, he, he is now, and I said to you, he is on their face. He is right in front of them. He is beginning to do battle with the religious, uh, uh, the religious group that controlled uh, Judaism and controlled Jerusalem and controlled the temple. And one of the things I said to you, I gave you kind of the symbol of the temple at this time being like a boxing ring. Like a boxing ring with Jesus in one corner and all these religious leaders on the other. And, and what's going on in the temple at this time is a confrontation, a serious, serious, extremely serious confrontation 
that eventually concludes with him being crucified. And I shared with you, um, and, and it's, it's up in, in um, uh, it, it's up in the screen, uh, some of the things um, where Jesus' uh, authority is questioned, and he gives three parables, uh, three parables that were supposed to say to the religious leaders, you have failed. You have failed. One of the parables was the parable of the two sons, if you remember that one. Then he came with the parable of the vineyard, where the vineyard will be taken away from them because they didn't produce fruit, and it's going to be given to another nation that will produce fruit. And then there's the parable of the, of the, of the wedding feast, where the king throws a wedding feast for his son, and he invites the people that normally should have come. They were the normal ones that would be invited to enter into the wedding feast. And by the way, the wedding feast may be a symbol for the kingdom of God, and he's inviting those that were naturally to enter the kingdom. And people just kept saying, no, I'm too busy. I can't go to your son's wedding. And he would send more, more um, servants to call them and say, look, I have everything ready. I've done everything for you. The the lambs are killed, the bulls are ready, the meal is ready. No, no, one goes to his uh, job, another one does something else, but they just don't want to enter. And eventually the king says, well, go and invite everybody else. And, and you can kind of see right away who gets rejected and who gets invited. And the ones that get invited basically are the Gentiles, that's you and I, that get invited into the kingdom of God while some of these or most of these religious leaders uh, seem to be rejected from the wedding of the Son of God. And what happens after that is an encounter, a real blow-by-blow -blow conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. Uh, it seems that, uh, which is, uh, I believe, number five there in the screen, uh, the, the Pharisees decide, by the way, there were three parables, but now there are three questions that they want to tempt Jesus with. Okay, three parables, three punches from Jesus to them, and now they come trying to trick him three times. Okay, and in the first one of them, uh, the Pharisees kind of go aside and they kind of get together and say, well, how are we going to trick Jesus and cause him to fall? to say something that we can use uh, to put him in a bad light and to show that he's neither for God nor for the emperor. They really want to trick him. And so what they do is they send some of their disciples, some of the Pharisee disciples, some of those that were part of the Pharisees that represented the law, represented God, represented God to the people, and they were the representatives of the Word of God to the people, and they send the, these Pharisee students, these Pharisee disciples, but they don't send them alone. And that's an amazing thing. There is a strange marriage between these Pharisees who were constantly against Caesar, Okay, because they were for God and they themselves were against the pain of the temple tax. But they send with those disciples the Herodians. The Herodians are people who are party to the work of Herod the king and who are in favor of Caesar. The Herodians are for the Romans. Herod had been placed as king of the Jews by the emperor, and the Herodian family was supported by the Roman emperors. And they should have been at odd with each other, but in order to trick Jesus, they kind of marriage each other, and they come together to put Jesus between the Pharisees, between the Herodians, between the Word of God, and between the emperor. And they come to Jesus with the intent of tricking him and causing him to fall. 
And I'll get back to that in a moment a little more. Because my sermon last week, my sermon last week was on stewardship. And one of the most important things I said to you in my sermon last week is that the issue of money is really insignificant once you understand the great stewardship that has been placed on our shoulders and in our hands. And I spoke to you about that we are stewards of God's grace, that we are stewards of God's presence, that we are stewards of God's kingdom, that we are stewards of God's mysteries, even though mysteries misspelled there, uh, and that we are stewards of the revelation of God. Okay? That we, listen, when you understand that we are stewards of these things, our time, talent, and treasure, it becomes insignificant when we understand how great a stewardship has been given to us by the Lord for us to be fruitful in these things. And so this kind of is the last two sermons, but today we're not too far from either of them. Because in today's sermon, we are back in the temple with Jesus. We're back inside the ring with Jesus. We're back inside the ring, and we are also talking about an issue of stewardship, and primarily we're talking about the stewardship of your hearts. Where are your hearts when it comes to the Lord? Where is our heart in reference to our God and to our Lord Jesus Christ? That is the issue this morning. That is the issue, and I'll explain a little bit. This is the question, this is the question that every believer has always has to ask themselves throughout time, from beginning of time to the end of time, and even today we have to answer the question, where is my heart when it comes to the kingdom of God? Where is my heart when it comes to the person of God? Where is my heart when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ? Where is it truly? Not where we think it is, but where is it truly my heart when it comes to who God is and what God wants of us? Jesus is in the temple, as I said before. Jesus is possibly in the area that we know as the court of the Gentiles. And the reason we know he's in the court of the Gentiles is that that's where the temples of the money changers were. That's where all the selling was being done. That couldn't be done deeper inside the, uh, the temple. It couldn't be done in the court of the women. It couldn't be done in the court of the men or the court of the priests. It, it had to be done there in the, in, in the court of the Gentiles. And uh, the court of the Gentiles there is where you see uh, these people on, on the left side or the right side that are walking around. That's the court of the Gentiles. So that's where Jesus is, which also tells us that Jesus is with a great multitude of people. After all, this is the Passover celebration. And after all, we are talking about Holy Week. This is Monday or Tuesday of Holy Week. And Jesus is here teaching in the temple. In Matthew 22, verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. And then in verse 16 of chapter 22 says that they came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, look at how they butter him up. They're ready to throw him under the bus. They're ready to get him to commit to something. So be careful when people try to butter you up before they lower the boom. 
Okay, just know who you are and be humble in the Lord always. So they come with these words, teacher, we know that you are true. And you teach the way of God in truth. And we also know that you don't care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. In other words, what they're saying is, Lord, we know that you are for God 100%, and we know that you are so for God that you really don't care what people think of you. And you're not going to say something just to make somebody feel good or for political correctness. You're not going to be politically correct, Lord. We just know that you're not because you are for God and you're going to say the truth, whatever it is. And Lord, we love that about you. And so we're coming to you with this question. And so here is the question. In verse 18, it says... But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites, you actors, you fakes? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. There's no catching him. But the thing that I find of interest is not just his answer. The thing that I find of interest is that Jesus does not have a denarius. And so he asks them, bring me a coin. And they're the ones that have a denarius. And here's the problem. The problem is that a denarius is a coin which is a Roman coin. It's not a Jewish coin. In fact, the purpose for the money changers in the temple was to exchange the Roman coin for a Hebrew coin because the Hebrew coin has no image in it because of the second commandment. You will have no other God but, but me. And that's the first one. And you will not create any image of anything under heaven, below the earth, or even below the earth. You will not bow down and worship any image. Any of that would be idolatrous. So those coins could not be offered in the temple. They had to exchange them for a Hebrew coin that would have no image. And yet when Jesus says, give me a coin, they're the ones that go in their pocket and they bring out a coin with an image, the image of the emperor. And I, I found that interesting. And then he says, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar. You see, the, the problem with this passage, and I don't want you to miss it, this passage in reality is not about paying taxes. Even though that is true, and that is in the surface what is going on, it's about taxes. The, the issue for the Pharisees is to trick Jesus, but the issue for Jesus is whose image, whose image are you? What image represents authority? What image is the image that you should have in your heart? This is a battle between Rome and the church. This is a battle between the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God. And it's over whose image is in that coin. And Jesus said, if that image belongs to Caesar, then give it to Caesar. But the image that belongs to God is the image of God that is in you. And that what was missing in the religious leaders. 
Because the image of God would not be to trick the Son of God, to trick the Messiah, and to bring about the crucifixion. The issue is over the image. Even though in the surface it is about paying taxes and about coins. And I don't want you to miss that. Because it's ultimately about whose authority are you under? The authority of Rome, which the coin represented, or the authority of God, which you represent? The image on the coin at the time of this occurrence in the life of Jesus is the image of Tiberius Caesar. The image of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor at the time. In the front of the coin, and, and I think I've offered you a couple of pictures of two coins, look at how small the denarius is, but the previous image gave you more of a picture larger of, uh, of, of the denarius. And over the image of the emperor, it basically says, Tiberius, son of God. And in the back of the coin were the words, Divus et pontific, Pontifex Maximum. Divus et Pontifex Maximum. Divine and highest priest. That's the coin that is being presented to Jesus. It represented the authority and the power of Rome over all the lands they ruled, their superiority, and their ownership of that land, those lands. But to the Jews, it represented the symbol of oppression, their dependence on Rome, and the offensiveness of their position as subjects, as oppressed people by a foreign power. The thing is they couldn't use those coins to be brought into the temple for the offering of God, but they also could do no commerce without those coins. So most Jews probably had those coins in order to bargain and in order to purchase and in order to do things, but then they needed Hebrew coins in order to bring the worship of God, and they're caught in between not just two types of coins, they're caught between two kingdoms, two images, two authorities, two powers. The tax was a, t a head tax. A head tax that had been imposed upon the Jewish people by Rome many years before, and every year they had to pay a head tax. Kind of a census. And guess where the head tax went to? The head tax went to support the legions. The head tax went to support the oppressors. The head tax were to go when to pay the soldiers and to buy their swords and to buy their shields and to enrich Rome at the cost of the Jewish people. That's where the head tax went. Now I realize, as I said, that this is not about really, truly, it's not about money. It truly is about the superiority of God and the superiority of the image of God and the superiority of the authority of God over any kingdom and any government and any powerful individual that might want to be over the Lord and over the Lord's people. Surrender unto Caesar what is Caesar's. You may need those coins, just give them to Caesar. But the most important thing is what in your lives belong to God and are you giving it to Him? In our lives, in our lives today, 
what happens many times in our lives is that we give all authority to Caesar and God is rendered secondary in the image of God and the service of God and the authority of God in our lives, even as Christians. I'm not even talking about the world. We tend to, you see, IRS comes to your door. They don't even come to your door. They take it automatically from your paycheck, even before you see a paycheck. They don't ask you, they take it. God asks you that you place His image in your heart, and we tend to give more authority to commerce and the way we spend money and the way we pay our taxes than the way that we deal with God, God's authority, God's sovereignty over our lives. We get confused as much as the Jewish leaders were confused in the Jewish authorities. We give such power to money. We give such power to the power of economy and the power of money, and we relegate the power and the authority of God to a secondary position. We always, when we talk about tithing, we always say, what do I have left before I tithe? What do I have left after I've paid my house and paid my car, my two cars, my three houses, my, or my one house? And let me not be exaggerating. But how much do we spend that we have to pay first before we give God what is due God, which is the image of God in our hearts, in our lives, and in all that we are. We have exchanged the holy for the unholy. We're giving more authority, more power to the unholy over the holy one. We want to give God what's left. And we feel content but I don't think God feels content when we relegate His image and His authority over us and we put the government first and God second, or third or fourth. And that's unfortunate. And that's wrong. Because God is the Lord of the universe. And we've got to reverse this balance. God has to be first, and then everything else needs to come second. The image of God in you has to be of more value than the image of God in a, the image of Caesar in a coin, or the image of Jefferson, or the image of Benjamin Franklin, or the image that are in our bills. They need to come second and third to the image of God because you know what? You are the ones that portray the image of God in the world. The image of God is in you. And that image has to be exalted above everything else. Now let me share with you a little bit about my own testimony since we are in stewardship campaign and since we are headed for our Covenant Sunday next, next week. I grew up in church. Uh, as a young man, I, 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 I really be, began to go to church when I was probably in my, in my 10, 10, 11, 12, 13, back in Cuba where I'm from or where I came from many years ago. Eventually, I became an Episcopalian in Cuba, in Guantanamo. And as I grew up, I learned to love my church, because I did. I love my church. I love my pastor. I love my brothers and sisters. And I love the Lord. And I became a giver. And I, I want to say to you, I was a giver. I wasn't a tither. I was a giver. I was a giver because that's, I love my church. And I knew that the church needed to pay everything, the lights, the pews, the Bibles, everything. And so 
I became a giver. The moment I got employed in my early uh, uh, 20s, when I seriously got employed, um, I began to give to my church. Eventually, someone in the church gave me testimony about tithing. And at, at first, my thought was, that's not for me. I mean, uh, they need to be happy with what I give. This business of giving 10% of my income to the Lord, it, it didn't quite wash with me. But the person that was kind of mentoring me indicated to me, and just said it simply, he says, look, the tithe is, is the way you worship the Lord and you honor Him. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. Out of the 100% that the Lord gives you, the tithe belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. And he began to mentor me on it, and he really convicted my heart that if I really, truly love the Lord, 10% of all my income would be for the Lord. And my wife and I had just gotten married, uh, I think my first daughter, Odmara, who's here today, uh, she's always here. My daughters, they worship with us. But, but Odmara was probably about a year old. And my wife and I, we hardly made $1,000 together. Of course, gas was 39 cents a gallon. Rent was $160 a month. But my wife and I did not make $1,000 together, and, and my wife and I talked about it, and we prayed about it, and we decided that we were going to attempt to tithe to the Lord. And we would start by giving the Lord $100 a month, which was about 10% of our gross income. And we started giving $100 a month. And we did that for a number of years. Eventually, the Lord kind of convicted me of why is it that if the IRS takes their percentage from the gross, I tithe from the net. And I said, wait a minute, why would they take from the larger amount and I give to God from the lower amount? And we switch things and we decided that we would start tithing from our gross income before the government took its cut. That we would tithe from the gross and not from the net. And we started tithing from the gross of our income. Eventually, the more I read the Bible, the more I was convicted that if the first portion of any income in my life belonged to the Lord, I would represent that by whenever I get paid, the first check I wrote would be the one for the Lord's ministry. Not the second check, not the third check, not the fifth check. Even if it was 10%, I wanted to say to the Lord, you come first, and the first check I'm going to write is going to be for the ministry of the Lord. And I've been doing that for all of my life that I've spent to this day, where 10% of my gross income and my wife's gross income and anything else that may come in, 10% goes to the Lord, and the first check that I write is the Lord's. Because I want to say to the Lord that He is first in my life and above all other needs in my life because He is my ultimate provider in this life and in the life to come. And therefore, I was going to honor Him through my tithe. And let me tell you, I started with $100 a month. I won't even tell you what my tithe is today because that's between me and the Lord. But I have to tell you that it's a lot larger than $100 a month. And the Lord has blessed me every day of my life. He has blessed me because His promises 
are true. And I will put him first in my life. I will put him first in my life, whether in my income or any other part of my life. I will make him first. I have learned that when it comes to tithing. I have learned that my tithe is an act of worship. It's not an act of giving money. It's an act of worship. It's an act of saying you are worth everything, Lord. You are worth more than anything in my life, and I will sacrifice everything else that you may have superiority. I have learned that tithing is an act of obedience. It's not about how you feel. It's an act that you are obedient to the Word of God. I have learned that tithing is an act of gratitude because He's actually the one that provides everything. He's the sustainer and the provider of life. I've often said, I've often said that you should never tip God. You should give reasonably, well-informed, and with a cheerful and happy God, uh, heart. You should never just tip the Lord. And somebody reminded me that today when we tip, we usually tip 20% or 18%. You go to have dinner, and immediately some of them already calculate the 18% and charge it to you. So if you want to start tipping the Lord 18%, that'd be great. <laughs> but the Word of the Lord says that the tithe, 10% of our income, of how we are blessed each year, 10% of how He blesses us and how we are blessed, that 10% belongs to the Lord. It does not belong to us. I have learned. I have learned to tithe. I have learned to teach to tithe. Because if I'm your pastor, I need to be the first one to do these things. And I want to challenge you to obedience. I want to challenge you. And some of you may be able to, and some of you, it may take a few years before you can get there. But I want to challenge you to let the image of God and the authority of God over our lives and over your lives to be greater than the image of anything else. And that the authority of God and obedience to God and worship of God becomes superior to any worship of anything else that demands your loyalty. Your primary loyalty should be to the Lord. And so Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar. He's not against paying the tax. He's not advocating to pay the tax. It's just that the image in it is the emperor's, so give that to the emperor. But the image of God in you, the image of God should be everything and superior to anything else in your lives. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And they retreat, not knowing how to respond to the truth that God has just spoken to them. And so that is for you the message today. It is the Word of God. It is not my Word. It is what I have learned about the authority of God and you go think about it, you pray about it, and you do as the Lord indicates that you need to do. Let the image of God in you and the authority of God in you and the worship of God in you be superior to your loyalty to anything else. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, please.